Uh, welcome. Today we're here with Matt Alberg and Luis Buenaventura. We're going to speak to Luis about uh, crypto in the Philippines. Luis is the co-founder of Bloom. He's the co-author of the Little Bitcoin book. And um, he also is an NFT artist on Maker's Place. Um, Luis, welcome. How are you today? Thanks so much, guys. It is uh, very much the evening for me here in the Manila. So we're uh, GMT plus eight. I believe we are the reverse of your time zone. So I'm always kind of in these calls where everyone looks like they're having, they're just starting their day with their first cup of coffee. I'm on my second whiskey. That's a very <laughs> common kind of occurrence for me. I'm on my awesome. second whiskey too, oh. but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Luis, I wanted to start with my first question, which is, is, what's the regulatory climate for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency like in the Philippines? Is the government accepting of it? Are they prohibitive? What's it like sure. on the ground? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like we started very similarly to all countries, right? It was kind of like a gray area where the government wasn't really sure what to do with it. I'm talking about like all the way back in 2014. But um, as of 2017, there actually is a regulatory framework. Um, that is available that you can apply for as a uh, we here in here in the Philippines, we call it a virtual currency exchange license. Um, um, you can apply for it. Uh, if you get it, you will be basically allowed to kind of carry out uh, fiat to crypto trades, uh, which is one of the things that my company does. Um, and um, yeah, there's at least about a dozen or so companies that have similar licenses uh, thus far. Um, and it's been that way for uh, about four years now. The, I would say that the government is um, is very uh, like open to the idea of of cryptocurrencies and financial innovation, financial inclusion, and all of that stuff. Um, although I would be less inclined to say that if we were just talking about the commercial banks, um, because as you can probably guess, those two things are not the same. Right. So just because the regulators are OK with it on principle doesn't necessarily mean the banks are OK with it in practice. Um, and I believe that's the same in most countries around the world, too. So uh, getting this license, how extensive of a process is it? Is it costly or is it actually pretty simple? Um, I would say that it wasn't costly in terms of money. It was costly in terms of time. It took us over a year. Um, to get our license. There are a lot of hoops that we had to go through. There were no real costs in the sense that it's not like they had like, I mean, there's a bond, you know, to kind of prove that you have some financial capacity, but that's pretty standard. I mean, even if we were just a foreign exchange company, there would be similar requirements. But uh, mostly it was just that, you know, we were the third company in the country to get it. They just had, didn't really know what to do with us, right? So it just took a while to get things going. Do you have an idea of how many companies have got this license so far in the Philippines? I, I believe it's 15 now, 15, 15 one now. five. Mm -hmm. Can you Nate, rattle off uh, some of the bigger ones? Well, Coins PH is the yeah. one that most people remember. Um, they were one of the first big ones here in the Philippines. Um, uh, there's another uh, order book exchange called PDAX. Um, that is also that was I believe the fifth company uh, to receive their license. So those are the ones that you'll kind of see a lot about. Like if you if you look at the Philippine ecosystem, it's Coins PH, it's Bloom, and then it's PDAX. Those are the companies that are kind of most visible. Luis, how easy is it for someone in the Philippines to convert their Bitcoin into Philippine pesos? Is it difficult or is it a pretty seamless process? It's fairly easy if we're talking less than $1,000 in value. And kind of there's a lot of different reasons for that. But suffice to say that the banking infrastructure here is only instant if we're talking about small amounts of money. And our definition of small amounts is $1,000 or less. So yes, if you were to, if you had a thousand bucks worth of Bitcoin and you wanted to turn that into peso, pretty easy. You either go to Bluemax or you go to the Coins PH app or you go to PDAX or you even go to peer to peer. We've got a lot of peer to peer stuff going on here. Um, and they will be able to deliver your pesos to you in, in minutes. Like we're talking two to three minutes or something like that. So very quick. Um, as you get, go, as you go up the ladder, kind of larger amounts of money, it gets a little bit more, um, tricky, but you know, for the average person, you know, it, it's, we're talking like a couple of minutes of effort, pretty simple. You need to have a bank account okay. for that quickness though, right? 
So uh, do most Filipinos have bank accounts? So you need to have at, at the very least a mobile money wallet. So if you don't have a bank account, mobile money works. Um, we've got a couple of those players um, here. There's three big ones. Um, uh, the, the, the banking penetration is still only kind of, it's under half, right? It's maybe about 35% or so. Um, the mobile wallets have actually, you know, kind of made some pretty significant strides in the last year, mostly because everyone was stuck in at home and during the lockdown, right? So suddenly everyone had time to learn how to use digital money. So that's been a boon for not just e-commerce, but also for the crypto industry, because suddenly all of our transactions and trades and stuff like that it can actually happen purely online without having to kind of do any of this you know kind of physical logistics and stuff like that and can you use these mobile wallets at pretty much any store like you can buy groceries with your mobile wallet and you can pay your electric bill with your mobile wallet etc so i'm i'm speaking to you guys right now from the capital city i'm i'm in metro manila but i actually live um up in a beach town up north about four hours drive from here so it's pretty remote. Um, every single restaurant there uh, you, uh, accepts mobile money. Um, I, you know, kind of weirdly, I actually I have less cash in my wallet uh, when I'm up there than when I'm down here for some weird reason. So yes, it's very pervasive. And um, with kind of the more rural operations, they had nothing to begin with. They didn't have kind of credit card POS machines or any of that stuff. So they did the being able to accept. Thing. Yeah, exactly. So it was a leapfrog situation where, you know, kind of they went from cash bills directly to mobile money for a lot of these very small businesses in kind of the rural parts of the country. At least that's how I've observed it. I've heard that at 7-Eleven, like every 7-Eleven, you can buy or, or sell crypto for cash. Is there like a lot of Bitcoin ATMs everywhere in the Philippines or, or are they pretty rare? So, I mean... Uh, I, I guess it depends on kind of how much detail you want to go into there. So technically, you're not actually buying or selling it from the 7-Eleven. What you're actually doing there is you are using 7-Eleven as an on-ramp, but you're actually trading with CoinsPH. Um, so what you're actually doing there is, you know, CoinsPH uh, Coins has a partnership with 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven is accepting the pesos on their behalf, or 7-Eleven might be disbursing the pesos on their behalf. But technically, it, the trade is not being executed on 7-Eleven. Um, there's no kind of 7-Eleven trading house or anything like that, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of ATMs. We've got a couple that I'm aware of, that, and they're both in the same city, literally within blocks of each other. I think the reason for the lack of this is mostly because ATMs are kind of regulated kind of at the same level as banks here, um, and, which kind of makes an ATM operator kind of business a little bit untenable unless you've got like a massive amount of capital to throw around. So what does become very big here are things like peer to peer, um, kind of the, you know, these very informal kind of trades, um, because people who got stuck at home during the lockdown, maybe even lost their jobs during the lockdown, they've actually been very actively looking for other sources of income. So the reseller market for, for cryptocurrencies here, uh, Bitcoin, Tether, Ethereum, all of that stuff, super strong. Like that's, it's a massive growth area. So the, these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, do they require that, that uh, crypto license or not? Well, so the peer-to-peer the -peer exchanges are not local companies, right? So the examples that I gave earlier, um, Paxful, uh, local Bitcoins, um, Binance has a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that's kind of, you know, in-house. Uh, so the, those are all very popular here. None of them actually have presence in the Philippines. They're, they're just mm -hmm. internet websites, right? So um, the actual people who are using them, I mean, that's on them, however they want right. to use it. But Paxful itself does not actually execute any trades, right? So they're kind of a meeting place, uh, a virtual meeting place, so to speak. But there's enough people who have kind of discovered this stuff and turned it into basically their livelihood um, to to kind of use Bitcoin as as a means to, you know, keep themselves afloat during the lockdown. And it's been kind of very interesting to watch all of this stuff develop very organically, very grassroots. Would you say the majority of, of the 
trading in the Philippines is taking place on peer to peer exchanges rather than exchanges like coins BH? Um, I would say that a very large majority is definitely taking. So, so those numbers are not revealed, right? So as far as I can tell, um, the only peer to peer marketplaces that actually share their numbers are Paxful and local Bitcoins. You can see that on coin dance. If you wanted to look it up, it's very easy to just see it. Unfortunately, Binance P2P doesn't do that. And I have a feeling that they're actually a very significant chunk of the market. Um, whenever Bloom um, kind of, you know, attempts to uh, sell supply, excess supply on Binance P2P, we can't even maintain, you know, an, an offer for longer than half an hour. We usually get sold out almost instantly. So there's a lot of traffic over there. And because they don't share their numbers, it actually makes it very hard for me to estimate exactly how big a chunk they are. But my sense is that a lot of the, I would say the vast majority of trades happening in the Philippines are happening via these informal connections, either peer to peer or some kind of OTC that doesn't necessarily have to have a licensed party on either end. Aside from the actual platforms, the peer to peer platforms, are there also a lot of like informal WhatsApp or Telegram groups that uh, are also organized and kind of done on a trust basis with with the administrators. Yes, for sure. Uh, Telegram, very big here. Um, Viber also, weirdly. Um, but yes, Telegram for sure. Um, I would say that uh, Telegram is where you would end up if you were talking kind of, let's say in the $20,000 range or higher, right? So kind of the more exotic amounts because you know most people don't sit on five BTC to trade per day, right? So um, that would happen in these Telegram groups where you would have to have multiple people vouching for you um, and and stuff like that. So kind of you know quite quite similar to to the early days of Bitcoin, um, just that the Bitcoin price is a hell of a lot higher than it used to be back then. We're still kind of doing those those same methods still kind of work uh, quite well over here. So the peer to peer platforms, you're saying they tend to cater to a little more of a retail audience buying smaller amounts, whereas the Telegram peer to peer groups, they cater to more of the business use case or the higher volumes. Why do you think one group goes to one platform and the other group goes to the other? Well, um, so the peer to peer platforms will usually have some kind of uh, compliance uh, restriction. Um, mm -hmm. They're not going to necessarily stop a very big trade from happening, but they will ask certain questions. They'll have additional requirements that complicates things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you know, it's good to remember that you know a lot of these trades are not necessarily just between one Filipino to the other. We've got a very large population of Chinese traders, Korean traders, Japanese traders. North Asia comes down here when it's cold up there and spend the summer here, right? So there's a lot of relationships that are just kind of year long, kind of, um, you know, um, we've got a lot of uh, uh, Chinese interests here, um, not just infrastructure, but like even just things like manufacturing and, and things like that. So um, there's a lot of overlap. And um, the, 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 the necessity for kind of having a longer conversation with your trading partner uh, it just it's just easier on Telegram, right? And then once you've built a little bit of trust, then you then the thing is like, oh, okay, yeah, I've traded with this guy before. I, I can vouch for him. Um, he and his group is, are you know trustworthy. You guys can trade. Um, it, it'll be okay, right? So social norming and and social credibility are all very important um, when when kind of that's the ecosystem that you're powering. And then back to Ricardo's original question. So if we take if we lump all the peer to peer platforms plus the WhatsApp or the the Telegram groups if we loop those uh, group those together and then we group mm -hmm. together the Coins PH and your company and the other companies with the licenses of those two main groups which ones do you think are seeing more volume as a whole? So okay, so I can't see the numbers of uh, Coins PH or or PDAX. They don't they don't really uh, share that. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, so my sense is that it's 60-40 in favor of kind of peer-to-peer -peer and the whole informal kind of trading thing. That's my sense. Um, mm -hmm. I, and that's, that's my sense based on kind of customer conversations and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But like, I, I've thoughtful. got no data to kind of really like, you know, like, because right. no one's going to share that data, right? I mean, <laughs> there's, no way to, there's no way to really right. see it. I wanted to ask you, Luis, is, is mining 
like still viable in the Philippines? Is electricity cheap enough? Are there mining farms? No, not for Bitcoin okay. for sure. No, no, no. We're nowhere near what you would need for Bitcoin. I, I assume there's still a couple of like, um, I, I, I forget my terminology now, but kind of not, not uh, proof of work for sure, not Bitcoin for sure. The other, the other stuff possibly. Um, but yeah, we're not competitive when it comes to electricity costs. We're not, we're not competitive. So there's a very, very small mining community here and it's mostly enthusiasts that I don't think they're doing it kind of at the scale that you would really need to make a dent. Another question I wanted to ask you is, uh, the Philippines is one of the largest U S remittance markets, uh, are people sending Bitcoin? Is it easier and cheaper? So, um, I guess, okay. So that's a kind of a bigger question. Um, my company, when we first started in back in 2015, the vision for our company was to become a Bitcoin remittance bridge into the Philippines, right? And, you know, uh, yeah, you're correct. Uh, the Philippines on average uh, uh, receives about 30, 32 billion dollars worth of remittances per annum. And that's, you know, to kind of put that into perspective, our GDP is only about 270. So, you know, it's a good, a little over 10 percent of our GDP that is kind of reliant on outside sources. Um, so it's a big problem. It's a, and you know, it's the kind of problem that you really wanna try to optimize. Um, I don't think that there's a very big uh, Bitcoin use case for remittances here. And I think that what's happened over the last couple of years, uh, especially is that um, more and more um, remittance companies are starting to look at stable coins um to kind of fill that need um they need something faster uh, but but the volatility of bitcoin gives people pause i think that's kind of the main problem there i and you know i've spent a good four or five years of my life trying to educate money transfer operators on how to use this stuff safely right and i'm talking about bitcoin specifically um and you know to with mixed success we managed to get a few customers uh, enterprise customers to use our rails, which is basically a Bitcoin liquidity bridge, but we we've not managed to really convince any of the really big ones. Um, the, those same ones are now looking at it again, but they're looking at it with stable coins as the thing to use, right? So like USDC or, you know, maybe Tether to a lesser extent, but I mean, I feel like USDC is just friendlier for a lot of compliance departments. And you got to remember that it's not just a technology problem. If it was a technology problem only, then we would have figured this out like years ago. The problem is that you have to convince every aspect, every department in that in that money transfer operator company, right? And that includes their compliance. And their compliance is skittish about anything that looks like Bitcoin for various reasons, what, whether that's correct or not, that's not, you know, kind of that's not, there's not much we can do about it. But if the compliance blocks it, doesn't matter if the CEO wants to do this, they can't override their compliance department, typically. So, so the kind of, you know, a lot of these companies are now looking at, you know, the stable coin solution to see if there is a, there's a thing there. Um, they're looking at not just the obvious ones like USDC, um, but they're looking at like Celo or uh, CUSD, I think is the, you know, um, they're think looking at stuff like that. Um, because, you know, basically any of these stable coins um, are viable as long as there's a liquidity partner on the other end that can turn it into pesos for them. So that's kind of the, the scenario that, that where, whereby these guys would actually start to really take this stuff seriously. So, so if I'm a, a Filipino American and I'm sending USDC back to the Philippines, somebody in the Philippines has to be like a willing recipient of this USDC. And let's assume that that actually is the case. Where are they going to spend the USDC once they have it? Um, you know, well, they I, typically, yeah, they typically won't spend it. What they'll do is they'll just convert it immediately. So USDC just becomes another bridge. So how do you convert um, so, the USDC to, to US dollars? I assume you're saying they convert it to US dollars? Well, they would go directly. So go USDC to uh, Philippine peso. Um, so, so let's go back to your original scenario, right? So you're in the States, I'm here in the Philippines, you send me 100 bucks USDC, I receive right. it in my Bluemax wallet, shows up as 100 USDC, I flip a switch, it turns into, uh, I guess that would be 44,800 pesos. And then it's just literally pesos, right? So it's pesos that I pull out, I 
take it and like turn it into like I move it over to my mobile wallet um, and then I spend it so at where, the 7-Eleven. Where was that USDC traded though? It, it, it had to go somewhere after that exchange for yeah. the pesos, right? Right. Uh, well, because in my in my case, I was using kind of Bloom's own technology, right? So we're a market maker for all of this stuff. Um, so we're absorbing the cryptocurrency that is coming in from our customers, and, and you're we're... selling it on on whatever crypto yeah. markets you can. Yes, exactly, right. And mm -hmm. we're in like five different uh, big ones overseas, and that's where we're liquidating the position. Um, so, and I imagine that the other guys are doing kind of similar things. So you have overseas accounts on, on these on big exchanges um, and you're selling your USDC there. Uh, and then those folks, if they want to, can convert that to real U.S. dollars. Um, but most of the time it's probably just floating around uh, in the USDC yeah. economy or whatever. Okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, USDC for us is as good as anything, right? Because I can turn it into Bitcoin if someone wants to come along and buy Bitcoin from me um, or, or whatever, right? I can use it to facilitate other trades. So uh, stable coins are valuable for us because we can, uh, that's basically what runs the business right now. Because when, uh, when some guy comes along and he says, I want to buy 0.1 Bitcoin uh, from, from Bloom, um, I need to have some ready USDC or USDT to kind of execute that actual trade because I'm not holding that Bitcoin in real time. I'm actually buying it when the guy uh, comes over to us to, you know, requesting for a quote or whatever. So um, yeah, that's, that's roughly how it's always worked for us. Um, and I believe that it would be very similar for, you know, kind of our, our other compatriots that are kind of in the same business. Um I looked up uh, just the Western Union transfer rate from the U.S. to the Philippines. It mm -hmm. seems actually comparatively decent compared to a lot of other countries. I thought mm -hmm. I saw like something around a three percent remittance fee, which is not too right. bad. Um, mm -hmm. So yep. Yep. Uh, the Philippines really isn't that in need of these new paradigm shifting remittance channels in the first place. Would you agree? Um, so that is a, so because you're in the States and the U S has the largest, um, population of Filipinos outside of the Philippines, um, the market there is tight, right? So typically, um, the rates get worse and worse, the further out you look, right? So in countries where maybe the Filipino population only has, I don't know, 50,000 people, for example, there's 3 million Filipinos in the U S. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of there's a, it's a sizable enough market that those co those rates get pretty compressed. But like to give you an example, um, in South Korea in 2015, that was one of our launch markets. Um, at the time, the remittance rate was like seven and a half percent because there was only about 50,000 Filipinos living there. Um, so, you know, there was no need for competition to make those prices tighter because there was basically no one else there were no other players in the remit the remittance market so that's kind of just the free market at work right um you know we came in and because we were kind of using a bitcoin rail the, the cryptocurrency rail we were able to kind of bring those prices down to like three and a half percent or four percent or something like that it was a very very big discount for the filipinos living in south korea but kind of globally, that is not, that's, that's just okay. That's not like, right. that's not a massive savings. So in other countries that I've looked at, um, when you send remittance through the official rails, like Western Union, for example, the government um, controls, you know, they have this official exchange rate that they control. It, the, mm -hmm. the government of the receiving end of the remittance, for example, in Nigeria. And they basically tell you, okay, we're gonna, if you're sending $100, here's how many local currency we're gonna give you. And it's honestly, um, sometimes they advertise it as determined by the market, but in, in actuality, it's really not determined by the market. And it ends right. up being a de facto tax on the remittance. Right. Have you ever seen any sort of sign from that by the Filipino government, or is it quite, do you have faith that it's a, a true free market of exchange? Um, so I don't have a lot of faith in my in my government. And I, I guess that's the kind of the, that's the that's the nicest way I can say that. Um, however, uh, based on kind of everything that we've seen, 
it looks like the exchange rate is a lot more freewheeling than than you would expect from something that is being kind of mandated it doesn't feel like it's being mandated if they're mandating it they're doing it very badly because it's kind of like really all over the place over the last uh, year and a half and like um you know say what you will about u.s policy but like there is no way in hell that my currency is doing better than yours but that is what's happening with the price recently kind of uh weirdly the philippine peso has been gaining strength against the u.s dollar um, intermittently, not not consistently over the last year and a half, but kind of it just doesn't it doesn't seem to make all that much sense to me. But like it seems to be like an actual messy free market economy. That's that's how I'm kind of reading it. Uh, I could be totally wrong, and I'm just not seeing the invisible puppeteer. Um, but yeah, it's um, it, it it seems a little bit too messy to be guided. I think. Luis, I know we're getting close to 30 minutes. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about living on crypto in the Philippines that you feel is important for people to know? Um, well, I mean, you know, the Philippines is a very poor country. And I, I think that's kind of the, the simplest way I can say that, right? So we're constantly looking for new ways to get by, right? And kind of one of the reasons why the Bitcoin thesis has a really hard time kind of um, taking hold here strongly is because the hodl strategy is hard when you don't have money. Um, you, do you understand? Like, um, sure, uh, like I understand that I, if I can hold this for two years, then you know the, the 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 reward is massive, right? I mean, we've seen that with every new cycle, but most people can't afford to do that, right? So they're looking for more straightforward ways. To, to make money from from cryptocurrency and the things that have surfaced over the last year and a half are things like you know becoming a reseller on the peer to peer marketplaces um, being a gamer um, in kind of the this whole new blockchain gaming space with the you know kind of the axie infinity type thing and stuff like that so you know I mean I know that a lot of that sounds like hype but um, Let's just say that a lot of our customers are young kids playing Axie Infinity who suddenly have jobs now. Um, you know, they're not making tons of money from it, but they're getting by, right? And these people did not have jobs uh, like a year ago, right? So kind of... Um, what, the, what is the, the deal? They, they play the video game and they earn in-game items and they sell the in-game in-game items. That's what's going essentially, on. yeah. They yeah they earn they earn uh, the in-game token. Um, there's a trading pair between that and Ethereum, and then or they can sell it to to Bloom. Bloom gives them pesos on uh, in exchange for that. So yeah, um, it it is pretty direct, right? You spend a couple of hours a day playing a game. And at the end of the month, then you've got like maybe three, four hundred dollars, which is way more than you would have earned yeah, if you had had a minimum. Yeah, like it's it's better than a minimum wage job in this country. That's for sure. So kind of those are the solutions that have kind of surfaced here very strongly because the hodl strategy is hard when you're poor. Um, and that's kind of again, it's a very blunt way of saying it, but that's kind of the the, the thing that has has kind of coalesced in my mind very recently is like, oh yeah, okay. So I understand now why these kids were not really paying attention to me back when I was kind of talking to them about Bitcoin and all of that stuff. It's because no one can do the two year hold. It's mm -hmm. just too much, it, it's too long a time frame for the average person. Now, granted, if you got lucky, right? And you bought in in late 2020, that is a very short hold. It's <laughs> for like three months and you'd be, you'd be in the money for sure. But like the timing on that is, it, it's not easy, right? Um, so kind of people are looking for something that's like a little bit more consistent, a little bit quicker, um, stuff like that. So kind of the, the, you know, when you look at the economy here, or the sorry, the, I should say the crypto ecosystem here, it's very, very different from what you would observe in North America or in Europe. But I don't think it's that different from you, what you would observe maybe in Africa or in maybe even in Latin America, right? I mean, I guess our games are different, but, you know, kind of the, the idea that, you know, there's a preference for these, I guess, what is Seyfedin's favorite um, expression for this? Like people with high time preference, right? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the problem in, in a nutshell. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily a preference. It's a need. <laughs> which so, is a, a pretty big differentiator. 
back to um you said um you you've really seen stable coins move in on a lot of territory that bitcoin used to be serving you know in the remittance game or just in the in the money transfer game and i've seen that in many other countries as well where stable coins are moving in on that territory do you think that's kind of like um some sort of um uh negative signal about the future prospect of bitcoin i mean bitcoin can be can do many things but in my mind this was always one of the really keystone anchor beautiful things about bitcoin and it seems to be losing that you know i'm actually of the opinion that you know uh bitcoin wasn't so great as a remittance bridge in the first place for a couple of reasons but the primary one really was that it was you had to do a lot of hedging on both sides in order to make sure that neither party was losing during the length of time that it takes to settle that bitcoin and that was kind of always the problem for us like having to explain that all of those that the tooling that we had to do on both ends in order to kind of keep the price from moving around so much like it always felt like we were bending over backwards in order to kind of make this thing work and and that was a problem right and you know kind of the the treasury team in kind of the money transfer operator businesses that we were talking to would have real issues with the fact that like you know they're at any given time this thing could move half a percent because half a percent is typically what you're aiming for in terms of profit like and at the end of the day so it's it was hard to um it was hard to convince them now um the thing about stable coins is that they're just they just move slower um, and what I mean by they move slower is their price moves slower, right? Their, their actual right. transfer is not much different. It's fine. It's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's at it's the correct speed, but the, um, the price doesn't change as much. Um, and that's kind of what we needed, I think. Now, does it invalidate any of Bitcoin's um, kind of goals or things like that? I, I don't think it necessarily does. But I think that it, it, it emphasizes that the bar is actually much higher than maybe we initially thought it was. Um, and Bitcoin has a long way to go. Now, so whether that is solved by lightning or kind of by um, you know, more technology that maybe we haven't seen before, I don't know. But um, in, the, in the interim, it looks like stable coins are kind of solving that problem just by being less volatile. And like we always knew that they were, and that was always the reason why they even existed. Um, and so maybe in this scenario, that is kind of what they're going to be good for, kind of as a stopgap measure, um, while you know, kind of you know, Bitcoin itself is still kind of trying to figure out how to really fill this need. Um, yeah, and I, I can tell you that um, this is learning that has only really happened in the last maybe two years, maybe three years at most, right? Um, three years from now, who knows where we'll be at? It's all, it's all still kind of evolving. And um, the stuff that's happening in El Salvador um, and kind of, you know, once we kind of see some more data about how people are actually using uh, Bitcoin over there, uh, whether or not Lightning is kind of facilitating these kind of safe transactions that we're hoping that it will that is not just safe in terms of security but safe in terms of volatility is there if there's a way that it's helping do that then you've got a model that the that the rest of the world can follow right um but we need data we need more data and um yeah it's it's not just like a couple of small anecdotes it needs to be like a little bit more we need scale uh, to mm -hmm. kind of really get a sense of this. And that's why it's like, I'm super excited about uh, El Salvador, primarily because they've agreed to be the world's guinea pig for this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, for better or for worse, we are going to learn so much from what happens there. Um, so I hope that, you know, kind of we're not just all really, really blindly optimistic about it. I mean, I want to be hopeful, of course, but um, we need to look at this stuff very, very closely um, because that's how the rest of the industry grows. The way that Strike works is it's actually just a, a US, a Tether account. So when you actually send dollars from one Strike wallet to another, it's, it's actually not, has nothing to do with Bitcoin, um, which is a little bit, uh, now if you're sending, if you're sending um, value from a Strike wallet to a non-Strike wallet, that is done using, you know, lightning channels. Um, in the case that 
Stripe users were coming to BitRefill to buy stuff. That was all happening over Lightning. But um, right. yeah, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the news was that, you know, all this Bitcoin stuff was happening, but really it's, it's like a, it's a stable coin database uh, for the most part. So why was it Tether? Is, was um, that a decision that was? Good question. Um, I know they, they have a partnership with an exchange in the U S that has Tether, but you're right. I'm sure they have the other stable coins as well. So right. yeah. that's a good mm. question. Um, why yeah. didn't I'd like to find out that? why, like why Tether of all of, of all of the other stable coins, right? That was, that's yeah. an interesting one. Mm. Isn't Tether the most volume? Um, I mean, it is, for, it is for sure. It is for sure. Yeah, uh, but I was just wondering. Strike wallet, if, if you're just yeah. transferring it inside of a strike wallet, you don't need those network effects of the, right. of the rest of the Tether network, you know? Right, 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 right. Exactly. So kind of, I, I feel like no one actually asked the question of why it was specifically Tether versus any of the other. There's so many other ones that would have probably been easier to justify from a compliance perspective. Um, but maybe the El Salvadoran government doesn't care so much about uh, those types of concerns. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting to, yeah. Again, new, more stuff for us to learn, right? Yeah. One way or another, though, almost all these stable coins, it seems like they have, they're practicing some sort of partial backing. None of them are fully right. backed, it seems, in that right. they're taking some of their reserves and gambling on the, on the open investment yeah. markets with that money. And that's how the, that's their whole business model, right? So Tether seems to be doing it probably more than the other companies. Um, but it seems like all these stable coins, they're employing some measure of like, uh, uh, you know, I think they call it's it. It's fractional reserve. Exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So. Well, well, we were trying to get away from that. So, I mean, if that's not a reason to eventually like, you know, kind of just turn all of this stuff back into Bitcoin at some stage in the future. You know, the, I mean, that's the that's one of the main reasons. That's I, kind of how I feel yeah. is is we're we're undergoing the stable coinization phase right now, but it there's going to be one of those critical black swan moments where one of the stable coins goes down because of their crappy partial partial reserves, and then that's yeah. going to make everybody go back towards Bitcoin. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, knock on wood that it's not. You know, I mean, if it if it's Tether and I mean, obviously, they're the ones that are it seems like they're the ones that are always under attack. Right. I mean, if it's not regulators, it's kind of just internally, they've got so much conflict. I I don't know. I it does bring the market down with it, doesn't it? And that's I guess that's kind of the big um, uh, it's the like I, I, I hope that it's not a massive black swan event. But, you know, uh, that's crypto for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's just another Thursday. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Um, which is, yeah, I mean, I what are your guys's um, like, uh, what's your read on this market? Like, are we are we over 40 next week? Are we are we sticking around? I'm 50 50, which is probably not the answer you want to hear, but <laughs> it could go in yeah. either way. Uh, you know, right. there are reasons, reasons to climb, reasons to go down. I feel like, in my opinion, um, we've really broken so many barriers that I, I feel like we could do a flash crash as low as 20, mm -hmm. but I just right. don't feel like we're going to go below 20 again. Um, okay. You know, there's okay. too many, there's too many network effects expanding. There's too many traditional big time investors that have kind of entered the market and mm -hmm. they're what they say as stupid as it sounds but a lot of these like um old school investors in in the us that have they have decades of reputation that they've built up you know kind of like the warren buffett types but right. he hates yep. bitcoin but the other ones um like ray dalio or paul tudor jones their yep. coming into the market gives it a, a certain amount of prestige that i think it it won't go below you know 20. i, I would think if it flash crashes, it, it could go to 20, but um, I would say probably not even below, you know, 25. So, okay. Okay. So thought. every, every, uh, every weekday morning, I, I write a very short newsletter to kind of like Philippi the Filipino uh, crypto community. Um, so, yeah. So I was running out of things to write for tomorrow. It's like, God, <laughs> like everyone just wants to, like, that's the only question on anybody's mind, right? I mean, are we going to see 40 again? When? When are we going to see? Are we death crossing? Um, and I'm like, oh, God, I mean, yeah, I forgot my crystal ball back in the 
beach town. So <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. I noticed there's a ton of Filipinos in the Middle East. Um, do you have any comment on that remittance channel or is it is yeah. it very tight and competitive or is there a lot of opportunity there or? Uh, yeah, that one's um, so, yeah, there's about a million Filipinos working in the Middle East. And that's like the entire that's about five or six different countries that, you know, kind of they're spread out across. Um, there's only a couple of um, exchanges there that I'm even aware of. Um, Rain is one of them. They're these two boys from Chicago. They're friends of mine. So they're um, are always trying to look for ways to work together. Um, yeah, the remittance industry there is is tight. Um, some of them are owned by, you know, kind of the, the kingdom, right? So it makes it a little bit hard to kind of compete mm. with them directly. Um, it also makes it quite difficult to convince them to try new things. However, if the, you know, kind of the, the decree comes down from the king, then everyone falls in line, right? right? But that's not the case so far with, with crypto, as far as I can tell. Um, so we've, we've tried, um, and, you know, we do have money transfer operators who are, um, you know, kind of partnered with Bloom and working over there. Um, but to my knowledge, like crypto just isn't on the radar yet. Um, everyone has at least looked at it and is familiar with it, but it's not like no one's really even piloting it, at least not to the Philippines. Um, but other countries possibly, right? Maybe to India, although India has a weird kind of stance on crypto also. Like I still can't read exactly, it, like it feels like one week India is about to ban it completely. And then the next week they're kind of, you know, backing up and kind of changing their mind on it. And I'm still not sure exactly what's going on there. That must be incredibly hard to, to kind of work within that kind of um, mm -hmm. framework. Um, you know, we're lucky here that at least like, you know, they they figured out the licensing thing four years ago and we're all just kind of operating under that and that's fine you know all of the compliance stuff that has to go into that that's fine we'll just kind of add it into kind of our normal business operations but not knowing if we're illegal or not that's that's tough dude that's like yeah. i don't know how to run a business that way so yeah did yeah. you see the ceo of wazer x was like they're summoning him as a criminal or something as of last week <laughs> oh my god um, for any peer-to-peer really? peer -peer exchange in India for, for a few oh years. Oh my so, God. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what that must be like. That's, that sounds nerve wracking at mm -hmm. the very least. Right. I mean, you must yeah. have some crazy commitment to your, you know, crypto beliefs to still kind of be, you know, like powering through that somehow. That's rough. Luis, thank you very much for coming on the show and answering our questions and staying a little bit longer than we had planned. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. That was fun. I hope we do it again. Maybe I'll have some better news about like what's happening with Bitcoin remittances here in the Philippines uh, next. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really enjoy being able to talk about the country, right? We don't get re really get a lot of um, uh, coverage on this side of the world. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things going on over here. Like if you believe Misari research, about 15% of Filipinos have earned or owned some form of cryptocurrency in the last year. That's a really big chunk of people, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so it's, um, uh, there's, there's action here. It's just that we're kind of not really covered by, by mainstream media all that much. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, check out bluemex.app, you know. And uh, I'll catch you guys next time. Cool, man. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the conversation.